I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to make this presentation to you today. Uh, so I have no financial relationships with commercial interests. Uh, I, I wanna show this slide first. It's, a, it's a, a viewpoint that I wrote for JAMA in January, uh, literally at the first time that it became clear that we were dealing with a new infection here. And I entitled the uh, viewpoint, coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. I did not mean at all to be facetious, but I wanted to point out to the readers who may not appreciate that we have had decades and decades of experience with coronaviruses. In fact, in this phylogenetic tree simplified somewhat of the human coronaviruses, which also, as you know, are very prevalent in bat species and other intermediate hosts. But the four coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are those viruses which cause the common cold, about 15 to 30% of all the recurrent common colds that we generally experience during the winter months are caused by coronaviruses. And then in 2002 and 2012, we were confronted with two pandemic coronaviruses, the SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is a pandemic outbreak originating in the Guangdong province of China, had 8,000 cases and 785 deaths, and it burned itself out because of public health measures without the benefit of a vaccine. And then in 2012, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, again, a coronavirus that jumps species from a bat to a camel to a human, it's still smoldering with new introductions in the Middle East. And these are the two pandemic or pandemic potential coronaviruses. They have been handled relatively well, all things considered. But now we have the third pandemic coronavirus, which was recognized in the Wuhan district of China in December of 2019, the end of the year. And the virus identified and the sequence put on a public database by the Chinese in the first week of January. This is now called SARS coronavirus 2 because of the phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus 1. So just to be clear, the disease we refer to as COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 19. There was a lot of thought and discussion put into what we would finally name this. The virus itself, as I mentioned a moment ago, is SARS coronavirus 2. So let's fast forward to where we are right now. The evolution and explosion of a pandemic of historic proportions, like nothing we have ever seen for respiratory outbreaks since the 1918 pandemic flu 102 years ago. The numbers are striking. Now having reached a million deaths and 33 million cases, the United States being the hardest hit country in the world, despite our designation as being the best prepared for a pandemic outbreak. The heat map here shows the relative prevalence, incidence, and now number of cases, relatively speaking, throughout the country. We've had 7 million cases, and we passed a mark just a couple of days ago of 200,000 deaths. And essentially, really, no particular end in sight, and I'll get into that in a moment, although there are some areas of the country that are doing actually quite well. I want to talk a little bit about what happened in the European Union compared to the United States, because it may not explain the reason for, but it will highlight the differences between where we are and where the rest of the world is. If you look at this slide, the blue line being the peak of European Union, which peaked a little bit before we did, but then when it went down and got under control, it had a very low baseline, which actually did extremely well for several months until just recently when several of the countries, particularly Spain, France, and to some extent the UK, tried to open up the economy again and were really went to the point where they disregarded some of the classical public health measures 
And you see they've rebounded now up to around 38 to 39,000 cases a day. But look at the United States. We peaked at the time shown on the slide, driven predominantly, but not exclusively, by the dominating effect of the Northeastern Corridor with the New York City metropolitan area, at one point accounting for about 40% of all the country's cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. But something different happened and re related to the degree of which we as a country shut down. As you can see, our baseline plateaued at an unacceptably high level of 20,000 per day. And when we try to open up the economy, according to the opening up America again, that some of you may remember, there was a great deal of variability as to the adherence of the prescribed guidelines. And over a period of a month or two, the baseline went up to 70,000 cases per day. And now we've leveled off at approximately 40,000 a day for the last few weeks. Why did this happen? Multifactorial, but at least one of the examples are, if you look at the degree to which we shut down compared to the European Union as represented by Italy and Spain, you can see that if you have various parameters that tell you how much you shut down, namely movement over time, if you look at the visiting of parks and outer spaces, look how much less we went down than Spain and Italy. If you look at mobility in the workplaces, the same thing, much less than Italy and Spain. And if you look at other parameters, such as visits to grocery and pharmacy stores, again, a big difference between the United States, Spain, and Italy. Quick look at the virology. Rather simple, we've been studying coronaviruses for decades and decades. It's a beta coronavirus. It has a large genome, an RNA virus, which means it will mutate. Whether those mutations will be phenotypically important, it remains to be seen. It has an important spike protein whose receptor binding domain binds to now the ACE2 receptor distributed throughout the body, including the upper and lower respiratory tract, the GI tract, and certain heart muscles. This is a picture of the conformational structure of the spike protein with the receptor binding domain colored in green. Now, the reason I show that is that this is the basis for most of the vaccine candidates that are now being pursued. Again, the receptor has been known since the days of SARS coronavirus one, and it is in fact the receptor for SARS coronavirus two. With regard to transmission, we all know that this is a respiratory borne virus transmitting extraordinarily efficiently, particularly in close contact. There is a degree of aerosol. We don't know to what extent that is. It's likely not the dominating mode of transmission as opposed to the classic respiratory droplets. The virus is found in multiple body fluids, but its role in transmission is unknown. And animals, both domesticated and zoo animals, have been shown to be effective. We do not believe that this is a major factor in human infection. This is a light refraction shot of what happens when an individual coughs or sneezes. In fact, we know now, what we did not know before, that speaking and even breathing lets out enough respiratory droplets for transmission of infection. And we'll get back to that in a moment. The risk of transmission varies between the type and duration of exposure. There are secondary infections are common in household contacts and in congregate settings, such as closed settings, hence the cruise ship outbreaks. There have been clusters associated with social or work gatherings that are non-household. Here are some examples. The now very famous Skagit County, Washington outbreak in a choir in which one individual was symptomatic in a closed space during choir practice and infected 87 individuals who were there with them. This is an example of a super spreader event, not necessarily a super spreader person, but an event. 
the right situation at the right time or the wrong situation at the wrong time. And here are some other reported examples of clusters, family gatherings in Chicago, church gatherings in Arkansas. Now, the CDC has recently come out with an analysis of what the risk, the odds ratio of transmission in different settings. And it's very clear as shown to the right side of that dotted line that restaurants, bars, gyms, and closed church gatherings are high risk for community spread. One of the most extraordinary aspects of this particular virus that's very perplexing is that about 40 to 45% of infections are asymptomatic, not pre-symptomatic, but asymptomatic, namely individuals who do not have symptoms during the course of the viral replication in their body and clearing the virus. The other thing that matches up with this that makes it difficult to do contact tracing is that a substantial proportion when you model it of cases of infection are caused by individuals who are without symptoms and transmit their infection in the asymptomatic period to an uninfected individual. And so with that, the fundamentals that we speak about every single day for the prevention of both acquisition and transmission are the following. Universal wearing of masks or cloth face coverings, maintaining physical distance, the six foot rule, avoiding crowds and congregate settings, particularly indoor settings like bars and not wearing masks. Outdoors always better than indoors. There have not been any reported super spreading events that have occurred outdoors. They have all been indoors. And again, frequent washing of hands. The clinical manifestations are protean. The incubation period is now a solid median five days with a range, <clears throat> excuse me, of two to 14 days. Flu-like syndrome really characterize the early component of this disease as shown on this slide. With one exception, a curious among several individuals, loss of smell and taste, which precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. Again, a curious and perplexing part of this disease in convincing people of its seriousness is the fact that most of the disease is mild. About 80% of individuals have mild to moderate disease that doesn't require any specific medical intervention. About 15 to 20% develop severe disease requiring in many cases hospitalization, intubation, and even ventilation. The case fatality rate varies from a few percent to 20 to 25% in individuals who require assisted ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are predominantly an acute respiratory distress syndrome. But as we learn more and more week by week and month by month, we see interesting manifestations such as cardiac injury manifested by arrhythmias with sudden death, cardiomyopathies with congestive heart failure, also kidney injury, neurological diseases, curious hypercoagulability with microthrombi in small vessels, and acute stroke associated with thromboembolic phenomenon. There's now a well-established multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, very reminiscent of Kawasaki syndrome. The other thing that's perplexing, new and we're learning about, is what some people call long haulers, namely people who clear the virus. So they are virologically, quote, cured of the disease. But for weeks and even months and maybe longer, they have lingering symptomatology that can be muscle aches, muscle pains, fever, uh, what people refer to as brain fog or an inability to focus or concentrate. These are things that in some respects resemble myalgic encephalopathy or chronic fatigue syndrome, although it is clearly different from that. Now, 
as was just heard in, in a very elegant way from Dr. Agarwal, there are collateral negative effects of COVID-19 and other health issues. So I'll go quickly through these because it was so well presented a little while ago. If you look at the potential indirect effects of this pandemic on the use of emergency departments, 23% decrease in heart attack presentations, 20% decrease in stroke, 10% decrease in uncontrolled high blood sugar. In other words, people are staying away from emergency rooms because of the fear of COVID-19. Now, we just heard about the cancer very well, the changes in the number of patients with newly identified cancer before and during coronavirus, just take as an example, breast on the left-hand side with the baseline to the far left with the dark green and look at the diminution as you go down particularly through March. In other words, people are not being diagnosed. In addition, 17% of patients in active treatment have reported delays in their cancer therapy and 67% of patients and survivors have expressed concern about health when you shelter in place. And my colleague at the NIH, Ned Sharpless, has written in Science a couple of months ago, the estimation that COVID-related reductions in cancer screening and treatment over the next 10 years could result in as many as 10,000 excess deaths from breast and colorectal cancer. So let's move on now to who's at increased risk for severe COVID-19 illness. Again, this is not a uniformly serious and fatal disease. It varies greatly. Older adults, if you look at the parameter of rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population, dramatic difference between children on the left-hand side of the slide and the elderly who have a dramatically more increase in hospitalizations than those who are young, and people of any age with underlying medical conditions. These are some of the ones that are strongly associated with an increased risk of severe disease. Paramount among these is obesity and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as well as serious heart disease, kidney disease, and others. There are other diseases that have less of a strong association of an increased risk. And they include those shown on this slide. I won't go through all of them, but I wanna point out two or three, which are prevalent. That is hypertension, diabetes, and other chronic lung disease. Again, the unusual and disturbing disparity of the risk of not only getting infected, but of a serious outcome if you do get infected among minorities, African-Americans, Latinx, and where we have enough data for Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, and Pacific Islanders. Look at this disparity, again, with the parameter of the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 and compare Hispanic and Black at 359 and 357 with white at 78, a dramatic difference. Quickly moving on to therapeutics, you heard a little bit about this from Dr. Agarwal, the NIH has put together a treatment guidelines panel made up of experts from throughout the country in various aspects of the clinical care of COVID patients. It's a living document that is upgraded and updated regularly, providing clinical data from established published data, as well as from expert opinion. It's easily accessible. There's the link, COVID-19 treatment guidelines, .nih.gov. With regard to the treatment, two of them have already been recommended by the guideline. I'll get to that in a moment. But there are others that are in various stages of clinical trial. Direct antivirals, convalescent plasma, that got an emergency use authorization, but we really need to wait for the results of the randomized placebo-controlled trials. There's hyperimmune, glo hyperimmune globulin, which will go into clinical trial shortly within the next couple of weeks. A lot of promise with monoclonal antibodies. And then there are immune modulators that inhibit cytokines as well as adjunct therapies such as anticoagulant. Let me take a look at two of these that have been reached the guideline panel for approval. One is remdesivir, which was the first drug shown 
in a randomized placebo-controlled trial that had a positive effect of diminishing the time to recovery in a thousand patient study in 10 countries. The UK did a very nice randomized controlled trial of over 6,000 patients in individuals hospitalized requiring ventilation or oxygen and a substantial significant difference in the 28 day mortality with dexamethasone versus the placebo. Of note, early patients not only did not benefit, they probably had a deleterious effect, which tells us something about we already know about the pathogenesis, that early on you wanna hit the virus and leave the immune response intact. Whereas in later disease, what you wanna do is dramatically diminish the hyperactive inflammatory response. I wanna talk a little bit about monoclonal antibodies because that really is important. We have studies that are ongoing now as I speak in the outpatient, inpatient, family prophylaxis when one member is infected and full prophylaxis in nursing homes. The data on these should be coming out within the next months. And finally on vaccines, we've taken a strategic approach. Namely, the federal government has made major investments in facilitating the development and trial of six candidates. And we've harmonized the protocols to have a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters for correlates of immunity. These are the three platforms that are being pursued, nucleic acid with messenger RNA, viral vectors, either chimp adeno, human adeno, VSV or measles, and classical protein subunit. Five of these are in phase three trial, two of which started at the end of July, just a couple of months ago. We should have results of these sometime in November and December. There's never a guarantee you'll have a safe and effective vaccine, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we will, looking at the preliminary data from phase one trial, inducing robust levels of neutralizing antibody. But again, it remains to be seen. We need to wait for the results of the phase three trials, which I believe will be available at the time we get to November or December. Could be earlier. I think that's unlikely, but that's not impossible. So the question I often get asked, even with a vaccine, when will we return to normal? Well, by the time we get people vaccinated, namely even those who are reluctant now but will hopefully change their mind, it's going to take several months. So what we foresee is where we are right now is we have non-vaccine combination prevention that we have all to a greater or lesser degree been implementing. If you have a partially effective vaccine, namely 60% as opposed to 75, 80, 85%, you are gonna have to continue to have the prevention modalities that we are dealing with right now, complementing the vaccine. If we get a vaccine that's 90 plus percent effective, there will be less dependency on the stringent public health measures. But I believe that at the end of the day, a vaccine will be available, but we will have to not abandon public health measures completely. So let me close with this last slide, which is the website for our prevention network. For anyone who wants information about the trials, or if even you wanna express an interest in perhaps volunteering for one of these studies, you can log on, no commitment, you can just express an interest. And if there's a trial near where you are, you can enroll. So again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you very much.